Mike Aquilina presents One Flesh of Purest Gold, St. John Chrysostom and the Mysteries of Marriage at the 2018 Newman Institute. John, your check is in the mail. I, have, I, know, I know you just prayed, but I have this funny custom. I always go to Our Lady first. So if you'll join me in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Now, I'm not recommending that you do this, but if you run a Google search on the terms John Chrysostom and sex, you'll soon find a mess of conflicting statements. You're going to find a mess anyway. Part of the problem is with the saint's interpreters, and part of it is with his, his own voluminous writings. We have some 700 sermons, 246 letters, plus biblical commentaries, moral discourses, theological treatises, panegyrics. I don't even know what they are, but we have them, OK? We have a lot of his writing. And when a man publishes so many thousands of words, an industrious enemy can pull together enough strands to make a strong rope for his hanging. And on the subject of marriage, John made it pretty easy for his enemies. Indeed, his paper trail is so ambiguous as to seem bipolar. On the one hand, when libertines want to caricature Christian teaching, they go to John Chrysostom. One anti-Christian website condemns him, I love this, condemns him as the arch-villain among, quote, the fathers of the dark age, pronouncing him guilty of an anti-sex, prudish, killjoy morality, anti-sex, prudish, killjoy morality. As evidence, they produce a number of his more shocking quotes. They also produce a lot of quotes that he never said. But there is this one, and he said it. He said, there ought to be a wall inside this church to keep you apart. The women have learned the manners of the brothel, and the men are no better than maddened stallions. And think about it, that's something he said during the liturgy, OK? <laughs> the sexologist, Havelock Ellis, judged John to be more than a little repressed. And even so great an historian as Peter Brown found Christian, uh, Chrysostom's vision of sexuality to be anxious and bleak. Where are they getting these ideas? On the other hand, John is also the father most invoked by those who wish to exalt the Christian vision of marriage. The Orthodox theologian, Vegan Garoyan, speaks of Chrysostom's virtually unique contribution to a positive Christian understanding of family life. According to Garoyan, the theological meaning Chrysostom attributes to marriage, procreation, and child rearing is profound richly Trinitarian and Christological. Garoyan goes on to quote John's famous description of lovemaking. This is John. How do they become one flesh? And then he answers his own question. How do they become one flesh? As if she were gold receiving purest gold. The woman receives the man's seed with rich pleasure, and within her it is nourished, cherished, and refined. It is mingled with her own substance, and she then returns it as a child. Gold receiving gold. That doesn't strike me as an anti-sex, prudish, killjoy morality. So how do we reconcile these two sides of John Chrysostom? Do we dismiss him as a hypocrite? Do we write him off as some kind of hyper-clericalist who held married people to a lower moral standard than monks. No. I believe both sets of quotations, the harangue and the poetry, make sense in the context of John's life. So let's take a closer look at his life. I'm going to take off my jacket because I get worked up. 
John was born in Syrian Antioch in the year 349. His dad was a high-ranking civil servant named Secundus, likely a Roman. His mother's name was Anthusa. Well, shortly after John's birth, um, Secundus died, leaving Anthusa a widow at age 20, 20 years old. St. John, like any good son, informs us of the simple objective fact that his mother was quite beautiful and could have remarried if she wanted to. She chose, however, to follow St. Paul's counsel to the unmarried and the widows to remain single. Now, it was relative, relatively common in those days for Christian women to enroll themselves in the church's order of widows, though it was rare for someone as young as Anthusa to do it at 20 years old. They were often discouraged because of the hardships involved in a woman's life at that time, fending for herself and for her children in a society that really provided them no opportunities. But these consecrated widows committed themselves to a life of prayer, continence, and service to the church. Anthusa's piety and sacrifice made a deep impression on young John. She set an example he would recall in his later preaching. He also had an aunt, Sabiniana, his father's sister, who followed the ascetical disciplines and served the church of Antioch as what was called a deaconess. Her contemporaries tell us that Sabiniana conversed intimately with God. So I think it seems clear that John grew up in a very unusual, almost monastic household. It was a monastery in the middle of the city. During his school years, it seemed he was destined to be a civil servant like his father. But with graduation, his desires took a turn for the contemplative. It was around this time that John was baptized. It was customary at that time to delay baptism until adulthood. Then he and a friend from school decided to form what was called a brotherhood, a household where they could share a common life of voluntary poverty, prayer, and contemplation. The young man had gone far with their plans when John broke the news to his mother, and she hit the roof. <laughs> Anthusa begged John not to make her a widow all over again. She pleaded, and he couldn't resist her pleading. So he agreed to pursue his life of renunciation at home with his mom and Aunt Sabiniana. He adopted the uniform of monks. It was a coarse, sleeveless garment. He took up scripture study under a renowned master in the city, and he applied himself in service to the Bishop of Antioch. At this time, among his fellows in the ascetical life, there was a young man named Theodore, who would eventually go on to become the celebrated theologian bishop of Mopsuestia. Well, somehow, after three years of living the disciplines at home, John managed to break free, and he joined the solitaries in the wilderness nearby on Mount Silpius. Now, it's hard for us to imagine the austerities practiced by these men, these young men mostly, living on Mount Silpius. John lived in a cave by himself. His diet was wretched. He spent almost entire nights in prayer and study. He would hold his arms outstretched so that he didn't fall asleep. And he would commit entire books of the Bible to memory while he read them by torchlight. He, did, he had no protection from the extremes of heat and cold. And he read the scriptures, as I said, for hours every day. He was so zealous that he continued these austerities even after his health began to decline. Well, after two years, he could no, go on no longer on the mountain. He needed medical care, and the other monks made him leave. They made him return to the city. Well, it was either while he was on the mountain or sometime soon afterward that his companion Theodore began having second thoughts about the ascetical life. He said his folks needed him at home. They needed him to run the family business. 
And yeah, there's this young woman who I kind of like. Her name is Hermione. In, in time, Theodore bolted. He erased his name from the rolls of the Brotherhood, and he went home. This is where John got his reputation. John's response has come down to us with the title, Letter to Theodore After His Fall, in case you were wondering where he stood, OK? You never wrote a letter like this. You never got a letter like this. We have it in two parts, two letters totaling 24,000 words in English. And from end to end, it reads like the words of a furious man shaking his friend by the lapels constantly for 24,000 words. Here's a little sample. Would you have me speak of the domestic cares of wife and children and slaves? It is an evil thing to wed a very poor wife or a very rich one. For the former is injurious to the husband's means, the latter to his authority and independence. It is a grievous thing to have children, still more grievous not to have any. <laughs> For in the latter case, marriage has been to no purpose. In the former, a bitter bondage has been undergone. Wow. Is this then life, Theodore, <laughs> when one's soul is distracted in so many directions, when a man has to serve so many, to live for so many, and never for himself? It gets better. <laughs> The rhetoric heats up from there, actually. He's just getting warmed up. The rhetoric heats up, and it boils over as John tries to show the transitory nature of bodily beauty and the grossness of its constituent parts. Here goes. I know that you are now admiring the grace of Hermione, and you judge that there is nothing in the world to be compared to her comeliness. But the groundwork of this is corpor the groundwork of this corporeal beauty is nothing else but phlegm, blood, <laughs> rheum, bile, and the fluid of digested food. For by these things, both eyes and cheeks and all the other features are supplied with moisture. So that if you consider what is stored up inside those beautiful eyes and that well-shaped body to be nothing else than a whited sepulcher, <laughs> the parts within are full of so much uncleanness. John goes on to compare such illusory and passing beauty with the true and lasting beauty of the soul of a monk steeped in prayer. Needless to say, the earthly beauty comes up the loser, right? He is careful to acknowledge that marriage is an honorable estate, citing Hebrews 13.4. But it cannot be honorable for Theodore. Here's why. Marriage is right, you say, and I agree. Nevertheless, it is no longer possible for you to observe the right conditions of marriage. For if he who has been attached to a heavenly bridegroom deserts him and joins himself to a wife, the act is worse than adultery in proportion as God is greater than man. Okay, for these passages, John has been vilified by secularists, radical feminists, and hedonists, even moderate feminists. <laughs> But I'd like to plead his case, or at least plead that his over-the-top statements need to be considered in context, in the context of the immediate situation, and also in the context of his life's work. John was, after all, operating in crisis mode. His friend had already gone back on a lifelong commitment, checked himself out of the Holy Brotherhood. Theodore was breaking a promise he had made to God. John recognized this as an emergency demanding forceful intervention, a time for tough love. 24,000 words of it. Now, some men use brute force in such circumstances. John, however, was a little guy. He was slight in body and frail in health. 
but he had no equal in rhetoric, no equal. So John used what he had at his disposal. He used his rhetoric the way some men might use their muscles. He marshaled his strength, and he used it to its utmost limit, because that's what friends do for friends. And he succeeded. He talked Theodore back from the family business, and even back from Hermione's charms, and back to the brotherhood to resume his life of prayer. Theodore would go on to become one of the most influential theologians of that century. We should also recall that John probably had, at this point, only the remotest experience of normal family life, mom, dad, and the kids. Remember, his father had died when he was an infant, and his mother's household was practically monastic in character. From this extraordinary upbringing, John proceeded to an even greater remove as he joined the mountain solitaries on Mount Silpius. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that John's upbringing was warped or harmful, nor am I sneering at his formation by the hermits on the mountain. I think both periods gave him the physical and moral discipline that he needed to withstand the hardships of his later life. But they were certainly unusual circumstances, to say the least. And they hardly equipped him for a positive, or even, I would say, realistic view of domestic life in the city. But that, too, would come with time. And that's why we, we need to consider John's doctrine of marriage and family in the context of his entire life's work. John wrote his negative statements about marriage when he was very young and inexperienced. As he entered the bustling life of the Church of Antioch, however, and as he emerged from relative isolation, what did he encounter? He encountered families like yours, in parishes like yours. He shared their life, he heard their confessions, he counseled them, and he grew to appreciate marriage not as a mere concession to weakness, not as a second-class citizenship in the church, but as a dis distinct vocation from God and as a path to holiness, to perfection in this world. Even more than that, he came to see it as a powerful image of God in the world, a type of God, a sign of God, a sacrament of God. But again, that came only with time and experience. John's gifts were evident to his bishop. He advanced steadily in the ranks of the clergy. In 381, he was ordained a deacon and licensed to preach. It was then that he earned the nickname Chrysostom, which means golden mouth in Greek. And he drew enormous crowds to church. After five years as a deacon, he was ordained to the priesthood. His preaching was so amazing that he would stand at the pulpit and complain that he knew that all of these people who had come to the liturgy had come only to hear him preach and that they were going to leave and go to the games right after the homily. <laughs> amazing. He complained. <laughs> Another several years passed before John preached the first of the sermons in which we, which we find his mature teaching on marriage, his homilies on 1 Corinthians. A few years later, he would return to the same themes in his homilies on Ephesians and then Colossians and his sermons on vainglory, which are really composed as a how-to manual for raising children. The first decade of his priesthood was a time of intense pastoral work in the second city of the empire. In a moving expression of his love, he told his congregation, and you could hear his voice choking up. You can hear tears in his voice when you read this. I know no other life but you and the care of souls. And what did John learn from all that work with all those souls through all those years? Just listen, and you'll notice a difference. Remember all the stuff about bile and phlegm and blood, OK? Remember that stuff? Listen to the guy. Just a few years later, 
There is nothing that welds our life together as the love of a man and his wife. There is nothing in the world sweeter for a man than having children and a wife. And he's not just blowing smoke. In the first decade of his priesthood, John had somehow come to the conclusion that Christian marriage was as much a divine vocation as Syrian monasticism, and that Christian perfection was, by God's grace, attainable in marriage and through marriage. Our preacher laments to his people, why it is just this that makes me sigh, that you think that monks are the only persons properly concerned with decency and chastity. This notion has been the ruin of us all. In the strongest terms, he assures his congregation that their calling is nothing less than perfection. He says, if the Beatitudes were spoken only to solitaries and the secular person cannot fulfill them, yet Jesus permitted marriage anyway, then all things have perished and Christian virtue is boxed in. But we know that that cannot be the case. And we know that he's speaking ironically. And so he continues, if persons have been hindered by their marriage state, let them know that marriage is not the hindrance, but rather their intentions, which made an ill use of marriage. What is it that caused John's apparent change of heart? Some people think he grew worldly, as pastors sometimes do, concerned as they are with budgets and leaky roofs. Some people think he was bought off by lamb dinners served up by the pious ladies of the parish with baklava. But no. We know that wasn't the case because we're told that he continued to live by all the monastic disciplines, including fairly rigorous fasting. We know that he always took his meager meals alone, and they always consisted of little portions. No baklava, thank you. He was a tough cookie. I believe that John grew deeper in his appreciation for marriage as he grew in the work of Christian initiation, as he taught group after group of the new Christians to appreciate the radical transformation that God was working in their lives through the divinizing sacraments. In a city like Antioch in the late fourth century, a pastor could prepare hundreds of adult converts every year. This was a time shortly after the legalization of Christianity so there were still people being won over by the hundreds, year after year after year. And John would lead them to the mysteries. He would tell them of the mysteries. He would tell them that in baptism, God would give them new eyes of faith. And John then would teach them to open those eyes. John taught them to attend the liturgy and to see themselves surrounded by angels. He taught them to look at their priests and see men whom God has raised not to an earthly ministry only, but also to a heavenly ministry right now, whenever they enter the sanctuary. John, John himself had visions of the sanctuary where he saw it full of angels. What John did is what the church calls mystagogy, the doctrine of the mysteries, guidance in things hidden since the foundation of the world. The mystagogue guides the new Christian through the external material appearances to grasp the unseen reality that is interior, spiritual, hidden, and divine. When it's used as a technical term in theology, mystagogy describes the period of Christian initiation that takes place immediately after the first reception of the sacraments. In the ancient church, this often consisted of daily homilies throughout the octave of Easter, eight days of sermons that revealed doctrines that had till then been kept secret and hidden from the initiates. The doctrine of the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist, the doctrine of the deifying grace of baptism. The preacher would go step by step through the rites describing the ritual words and gestures, and more importantly, explaining their divine meaning and action. 
John told his class of new Christians, what is performed here requires faith and the eyes of the soul. We are not merely to notice what is seen, but to go from this to imagine what cannot be seen. Such is the power of the eyes of faith. The eyes of the body can only see what falls under the sense of sight. But with the eyes of faith, it is just the reverse. They see nothing that is visible, but they see what is invisible just as if it lay before their eyes. For faith is the capacity to attend to the invisible as if it were visible. John spoke those words in his baptismal mystagogy, but he hardly confined his, this approach to his liturgical theology. There's a mystag mystagogical character, a quality, that pervades all of John's work. We see it in his homilies on the letter to the Hebrews. It's everywhere in his treatise on the priesthood. And I contend it's the principle that gives life to his mature doctrine of marriage. We could honestly and accurately describe his later doctrine as a mystagogy of marriage. He wants us to move from the icon to the reality. Still, he insists that we must also learn, and we must first learn, to venerate the icon. He says, learn the power of the type so that you may learn the strength of the truth. It's important for us to realize that John's mature doctrine of marriage is almost unique in ancient Christianity. You won't find this in all the writings of the fathers. Many of his contemporaries looked upon marriage as an institution that was passing away, fading away, as more and more Christians turned to celibacy. You want to hear some numbers? Listen to these. In Antioch, in John's day, there were 3,000 consecrated virgins and widows. 3,000 consecrated virgins and widows in a city whose population was perhaps 200,000. 3,000 celibate women, and that number doesn't include any of the celibate men in the brotherhoods or the hermits who lived on the nearby mountain. The Catholic theologian John Cavadini wryly observes that this was hardly the golden age of the theology of marriage. Many of the fathers ignore marriage altogether or treat it as a somewhat distasteful subject. One of John's contemporaries was one of my favorites, St. Jerome, and the best thing he could say about marriage was that it produced future celibates. <laughs> But John, in later years, glorified marriage. It pained him that Christian couples, for example, continued to practice the old pagan wedding customs, which tended toward the obscene. So shameful were the practices that few couples dared to invite their parish priests to attend their wedding and give a blessing. The celebration consisted of several days of drinking and body singing. The situation roused our hero to a passionate exhortation. Is the wedding a theater? No, it is a sacrament, a mystery, and a model of the Church of Christ. They dance at pagan ceremonies, but at ours, silence and decorum should prevail, respect and modesty. Here in the wedding, a great mystery is accomplished. For John, marriage is a sacrament, a mystery, a model of the church. This is the language of mystagogy. John's beginning to guide us through the mysteries. His mystagogy of marriage was unusual, as I said, for his day, but it had deep biblical roots. John grounded his doctrine firmly in St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 5. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery, says St. Paul, is a profound one, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. St. Paul then had included marriage among the great mysteries of Christianity, but he is himself digging deep to do so. 
drawing from the first chapters of Genesis. Indeed, any preacher like John, who memorized most of the scriptures, would notice that marriage is a dominant theme in both the Old and New Testaments. The Bible begins with a wedding, the wedding of Adam and Eve, and ends with the wedding, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And in between, God, speaking through the prophets, repeatedly invokes marriage as the preeminent symbol of his covenant. For John, marriage is an image of baptism, where the believer is wed to Christ. And it is an image of the Eucharist, which makes one flesh of the believer and Christ. He tells the new Christians, keep the marriage robe in its integrity, that with it you may enter forever into this spiritual marriage. Just as in marriage between man and woman, the bridal feast is prolonged for seven days, see how we too extend for the same number of days your bridal feast, setting before you the table of the mysteries filled with good things beyond number. Marriage, moreover, is an icon of the Trinity, an icon of the Trinity. As John teaches us, the child, the child is a bridge connecting mother to father. And so the three become one flesh. And here the bridge is formed from the substance of each. Just as the head and the rest of the body are one, so it is with the child. That is why scripture does not say they shall be one flesh, but they shall be joined together into one flesh, namely the child. But suppose there is no child. Do they then remain two and not one? No. Their intercourse effects the joining of their bodies, and they are made one, just as when perfume is mixed with ointment. What poetry. And at that point, John must have looked out at a congregation full of people fanning themselves and averting their eyes, you know, and blushing. Because he, the, next, the next line in his homily, he's moved to cry out, why are you blushing? Why are you blushing? Leave that to the heretics and pagans with their impure and immodest customs. For this reason, I want marriage to be thoroughly purified, to bring it back again to its proper nobility. You should not be ashamed of these things. If you are ashamed, then you condemn God who made marriage. So I shall tell you how marriage is a mystery of the church. John did not want us to blush at the mention of married love. But most of all, he wanted us to have no reason to blush. Among all the ancient mystagogues, John stands out for his unique emphasis on morals. He insists that the sacraments should leave their mark on everything we do in life. We don't check the mysteries at the door when we leave church on Sunday. The sacraments have consequences for every moment of every day. Through baptism and Eucharist, we become partakers of the divine nature, as St. Peter said. John would have us then live our marriages purely as Christ lives his. And he doesn't hesitate to speak plainly. He doesn't care if it makes parishioners squirm in their pews. There were no pews back then, but you, you get the idea. I think it's fair to say that none of the fathers, none of them, preached as frankly about sex as John did. What did this mean practically? Well, avert your eyes and start fanning yourself. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> It means that he, con he repeatedly condemned contraception as unworthy of Christian marriage and even calls it preemptive murder. He says, why do you sow where the field is eager to destroy the fruit, where there are medicines of sterility, where there is murder before birth? Indeed, it is something worse than murder, and I do not know what to call it, for she does not kill what is formed but prevents its formation. What then? Do you despise the gift of God? Do you fight with his law? John saw birth control as a violation of the type, a desecration 
of an icon, a defiling of a sacrament. If marriage is a sacrament of God, then it should be a true communion and truly fruitful, as God is truly fruitful. John also condemned adultery, domestic violence, sodomy, abortion, divorce, and other acts that are unworthy of the sacrament of Jesus Christ and his church, the sacrament of the Trinity on earth. I don't think marriage can get any better than John Chrysostom in his mature years made it out to be. For a married man or woman to read his homilies on Colossians and Ephesians is to simultaneously be humbled and exalted. Exalted because God has lifted us up so high in giving us marriage as a sacrament. Humbled because we must confront our own sin our own clinging to the mud of this earth. John learned to love marriage, and we should too. As a celibate, he lost nothing in the bargain. For if a celibate renounces something second rate, that's not such a big deal. But if he renounces something so great as holy matrimony, a sign of the Trinity, in order to live with the Trinity, even now, as an angel in heaven, if he renounces the sign in order to possess the signified, then suddenly the value of celibacy increases by orders of magnitude. As John himself said, whoever denigrates marriage also diminishes the glory of virginity. Whoever praises it makes virginity more admirable and more resplendent. What appears good only in comparison with evil would not be particularly good. It is something better than what is admitted to be good that is the most excellent good. Learn the power of the type, he said, so that you may learn the strength of the truth. It seems right to close this talk by invoking the words with which St. John closed his earthly life. Glory to God for all things. So let's give glory. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for your hospitality.